Welcome to stream 23 of uh, my NES programming series. Last time we left off, we were trying to get vertical scrolling working, and uh, I missed a key, extremely important phrase in the documentation over at Nestev um, related to how the streaming work, uh, not streaming, the uh, scrolling works. So we were looking at the registers. We were looking at PPU scroll. And there was this key line here where it said changes made to the vertical scroll during rendering will only take effect on the next frame. So uh, basically what that meant was that if you change your scrolling on uh, the screen while it was drawing, which is what we were trying to do, uh, for vertical changes, it would have no effect because basically what I was reading is that there is essentially some data that's cached in the PPU when it starts drawing. And while the vertical scroll position changes the line that's being drawn uh, and shifts it correctly for the vertical position. Wait, sorry, I might have said vertical for the horizontal position for the for the horizontal scroll when it's drawing, it will um, it will change it if you change that x scroll value. But for the vertical for the y scroll, it has no effect. So I was saying on the stream last time, I'm pretty sure that I remember that there were games that had um, vertical scrolling and I did some research into it and sure enough there are um, and then also I spent quite a bit of time looking at uh, a number of games and what they're doing while the game is running and rendering and it's uh, pretty amazing like you look at a game like RC Pro-Am and uh, you kind of realize you know how complex what it's doing is beyond just the game the way that it's updating the screen is pretty pretty impressive and, and if you've ever played rad racer it's also um a pretty amazing um a pretty amazing uh feat that they've met that they had managed to accomplish by uh the way they were managing bank switches and rendering things uh as the screen was being updated um, you know, and I don't know if that was something that just at the time the programmers just were like, well, that's what we got to do, or if that was considered sort of like a cool, you know, complex thing. I mean, I'm sure there was some, some of that, you know, you listen to, if you, if you ever played any of the old LucasArts games, um, um, like Monkey Island or Loom, you know that um, you know the team that made that just actually released a game called Thimbleweed Park, and they did a whole podcast during the the creation of the game, um, where they were talking about what they were working on, and they talked some of, about some of the history of you know how games were made. And there's definitely some talk about like cool effects, and also there's a podcast I was listening to called Designer Notes, where there's a an extremely long set of interviews with uh, Sid Meier, um, who created Civilization, if you don't know. Um, but if you're watching this, hopefully you know that. Um, and uh, and he was talking about how, you know, part of the motivation for a lot of the games they were working on was to just kind of show off a cool technical effect that they were trying to accomplish that couldn't be done at the time. So I, I feel like there might be something to that and that it was just sort of par for the course that in order to accomplish that you had to do something a little tricky and and uh you know not as simple as just updating a single register in memory so after researching this a little bit and um, digging deeper into the nestav wiki I found that there's actually a way to force the scroll to update um so uh let's see here is this it yeah so the, in this page we were looking at they were talking about how the memory in the ppu is addressed when the screen is being rendered 
and uh, and vertical versus horizontal scrolling. And uh, what I found is that you, there is a way to force the uh, vertical scroll to occur properly. Um, and the and this goes into the the details of why it works the way that it works and how to do the different splits on the screen and stuff like that. Um, so the long and the short of it is that we want to update in four separate updates. We want to update 2006 to tell it which name table we want to use. Then we're going to change the Y scroll value. We want to update the X scroll value. And then we again want to update 2006. Um, now let's, let's do, let's, let's mess with this. Um, there are a couple of other interesting things that we need to do in order to um, make this work properly, but we'll start with just getting this to happen. So um, the first thing we want to do is we want to, I believe we want to uh, bit do, do a read from the 2002 um, because that will reset the uh, reset the address at 2006 in, in the PPU. Um, we may find out that that's actually not necessary to do. But, um, sorry, I keep scrolling around. I'm kind of like looking for a good place to settle on here. Uh, I guess this is probably the best. Uh, now, so for the name table, we are... Um, we're not doing any sort of change. We're going to keep it in name table, uh, the name table in the top left corner. So that would require the, the value zero. So we're going to load A with zero. We're going to store that into 2006. Um, then we want to put the Y value and the X value into 2005. Thankfully, that's just zero also. And then we need to load the low byte of name table address to 2006, which is so low byte of the name table address. So the name table number shifted by two. Shifted by two is multiplied. Okay. Oh, right. So, well, so. Zero, four, eight. Is it zero two four? I guess it's what is it, eight, 10, 11, 12, 6? Okay, yeah, right. Zero, two, four, six. Okay, um, and then low byte of name table address to two thousand six. So. Let's see if they explain that a little bit better. I to full disclosure is that I had made this work, but I didn't really fully get why it worked. I was just curious to see if it would do anything. Um, so let's here if we if we do this, we should see sort of a partial partial result. I don't think it's exactly right. Um, So this isn't exactly right. Um, I'm actually doing this in the wrong place. That's the other problem. <clears throat> I want to do this after we wait for the sprite zero hit. I wonder if there's a way to do the same thing in as in um, FCEUX, where you just hit a you hit Shift F1 to reload. I'll have to look real quick. So that sort of accomplishes what we want, right? Like that's that's actually pretty close. Um, I'd like to really understand why, though, that that exactly works. Um, before we do that, though, let's go to the help here. I just want to see, is there a way to re reload? Uh, sorry, wait. I'll open the power cycle is, oh, okay. 
Where is that? Power cycle. Oh, of course there's no key keyboard shortcut for that. All right, well, that's a little bit better at least. So one thing you'll notice is that the line here is a little weird. And this is a, this is a visual glitch that comes from the change that we're making to, uh, to the memory as we're rendering. So this is a, this is a common effect. And if you ever played, for example, uh, I think I mentioned this last time on stream, Mega Man 3 has the same glitch on the main uh, select screen for the bosses. And that just comes from not timing this out properly. Um, so one thing you can do is you can just do, um, I'm just gonna have a very lazy, cause we're not gonna keep this. So um, load X with zero decrement X branch not equal to uh, a, well, I don't wanna load it with zero. I wanna load it with like 10. Trailing garbage characters. Oh, I can't call it A. Because that's the accumulator. All right, so power cycle that. And uh, so did it actually reload the ROM when I did that? Yeah, so that doesn't recycle the ROM. Um, so you can see that more or less that's better. Um, we're still getting some weird behavior where it's like juddery. Um, and that gets worse as you introduce things into the game. Like if as you bring in entities. And you can see, if you recall from last time, it was getting slower also. Um, I was talking to some of the guys on NestDev, and the suggestion that they made was that we should consider moving the code that does the population of the OAM memory into the main game engine loop instead of doing that in the NMI to give the NMI code the, the most amount of time possible to run NMI... Um, uh, graphical, graphic specific stuff, right? So like the DMA copy and, and any other graphical stuff. So we're going to move this over. Uh, do I need to? Yeah. So we're going to move that into the main game loop now. Uh, as soon as I can find it, where is that? so we're going to start the redo of the controllers and we're just going to go through everything that we need to to process the game data and then um Wait, I'm confused. What is this doing? Is it checking that? Check, uh, checking the game state. Oh, okay, because, right, yes. I. It's been a little while since you look at this. So, uh, the game state is playing game. Then... <clears throat> Where is that? Local gameplay state. We want to go to gameplay state, gameplay state. Okay, so we're initializing the sprites. We're gonna check the controller code. Uh, we're checking all our button presses. We're loading any entities we need to load. We're finished with controls. We're processing the scrolling. We're processing the entities, including some collision detection. So we're doing all of that stuff, and then we're done processing the entities, and then we're in the wait to, for draw to complete. So what we want to do is we want to add here where we populate the sprite memory. So this is going to happen while before, hopefully before the NMI occurs, while the screen is updating, and then we're going to wait for the next uh, NMI, or we're going to wait for the screen to finish drawing, 
and go back and do it again. Wrong key. All right, so let's uh, see if this is better or worse uh, or broken. All right, so shooting a bullet is causing a lockup. Um, launching the entity doesn't do anything. No, no, that's still locking it up. So somewhere I'm getting locked up. Uh, let's see, why? Initialize sprite zero. Drawing our entities. I mean, I think when you think about the sequence of this, and I'm gonna, I'll think about it out loud for your benefit, which means it's going to be harder for me to do. Um, but so we're going to do. We're gonna have our game loop, right? So that's our game loop. And then we have the NMI. And NMI is essentially just at this point, For the gameplay state, it is resetting the registers for the PPU to be ready for drawing properly. So we're um, setting PPU, right? And then we are uh, doing DMA. So our DMA copy of our sprite shadow copy of the the actual hardware sprites and then we are doing our regular scroll right so this is the uh, background scroll and then we are well actually so now this is what we want to do we want to move this so we want to move this because we want the nmi we want to make sure that the V blank has cleared out that bit. I think that's right. We don't want to start until that's been cleared out, which means that, let me see, let's go back to the reference here to make sure that I've got that right. Uh, because set when and on zero, yeah cleared at dot zero of the pre-render line. Once for blah, 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 blah. reading the status, okay. Yes, right zero hit to make a bottom scroll bar below vertical scrolling or freely scrolling play field. Be careful to ensure the tile. Yeah, sprite zero hit is not detected, okay. Um, Reading PPU status at the exact start of the vertical blank will return zero in bit seven. Well, you know, actually, that's an interesting point. Like, if we're not doing, if we're not doing anything but graphical stuff here, we don't actually have to check this at this point because we know that the the NMI got called, and. We're gonna do a little bit of stuff. So by the time we're done, I mean, it's not nothing now, but it's it's not as much stuff as it was before. So it's unlikely that we're gonna miss sprite zero and then drop a frame versus before where we were iterating through all of our entities, right? So before we had this other intermediate step here, right? That that now goes away, right? This was This was sprites that were being loaded into memory. But now that goes away because we moved it up here. So in the game loop, we're checking input. No, it's not IO, it's input. 
then we're checking uh, spawn, right? Do we need to create anything? Then we're checking collision. And then we're doing sprite copy or sprite, uh, shouldn't say sprite copy, sprite uh, memory, right? So got rid of the wait for sprite zero to get cleared. Let's see if, I don't think that'll fix the problem, but it wasn't necessary anymore. So let's see here. <laughs> so what, this is all locked up now. Oh, scrolling isn't happening anymore. Okay, well, the good news is that this is okay. <laughs> That's strange. Why did scrolling break? Is it because this is happening too quickly? Did I branch if equal to wait sprite zero? Oh, was I wrong and we do need to wait? I mean, let's see. I guess it shouldn't happen right at the beginning, though. It said very clearly that if you check it at the beginning, it's likely that it's going to be wrong. So, let's do it here right before we check. So, the scrolling is working okay now. But if we fire a bullet, it gets locked up. Okay, so there's something, something obviously wrong with the way that's behaving. So wait for draw to complete is this jump game loop. Did I draw complete is still being called. take a look at the draw entities code. I wonder if there's something in there that only works in the way it was in the DMA, or sorry, the, um, the NMI code for some reason. It shouldn't matter. So we're using X to do the indexing. So if it were, well, let's take a look at actually first creating the bullet. Well, I'm assuming I'm assuming something about the way that this is getting locked up, but I should probably just take a look since it's definitely super, you know, locked up here. It's not like it's kind of processing or anything. It's just totally locked up. So what is this doing? Branch not equal load A. <clears throat> That's weird. So what is um, initialize sprite zero? What code is this? This is this is the NMI. So this is waiting for. That's waiting for sprite zero, right? Branch not equal. Branch, no, that's okay. So that's waiting for the sprite zero to actually get hit. Uh, Oh, 
Okay, so it's po all right. I know what the problem is. I think so. The problem is we're doing the loop, checking for sprite zero hit, but the sprite hasn't actually been rendered yet because we're going into. Well, actually, that can't be true because otherwise it would have locked up right away. I mean, that's what it seems like is happening, is that it's locking up because Sprite Zero is... I wonder... Oh, it could be that when I moved it, the initial index that's being used is wrong for populating the sprites, and then it's removing the Sprite Zero that we want to actually hit. Let's see. At some point, we were doing a load x of a value of uh, four, I think it was, to um, skip. Okay, it's load y. So draw entities include. So the y value has to be four. <clears throat> contains the index check bullet can, okay so that's that's a separate subroutine is let's see transfer y to a push a so we are preserving y pull a a to y so it's not like y is getting clobbered by the draw entities call You know, I just actually realized we don't even have to do this. Technically, well, it, I was going to say we could change the, the address and memory that we're storing into the sprite mem low byte to be starting at 4, but we need y to count up to the maximum entity. So, yeah. Is, oh, is the NMI code initializing sprite mem and messing that up maybe let's see that's load level that's okay load tiles wait for v blank this is the game loop that's okay initialize sprites loop that's Fine. That's clearing out the sprites. Begin populating OAM memory. Uh, why? So it's almost like the sprites are disappearing and causing. All right. So if I create a bullet. It obviously goes away. I wonder if it's just because we're not populating the memory with sprites quickly enough, and so the NMI is dropping a frame. That's the only thing I can think of, is that we're our sprite zero. Yeah, so sprite zero. So what we need to do we need to ensure that we're always getting sprite zero populated no matter what. So we it's almost like we should be moving this before we do anything else, just in case. But that also makes me concerned because that means we're taking an awfully long time to process all this stuff. We're hardly really doing anything. Um, so, wait. Let me do this before we check the buttons. Before we do anything, we gotta load sprite zero. So we make sure that that's always set with something that's gonna cause the sprite zero hit once we go into that state of the game. Yeah, okay, oh, damn it. Uh, that's... Sprites loop. Do I have a 
subroutine for clearing the sprites. This is, well, I mean, the easiest thing for that is technically we can just do this. That's assuming that I'm right about this being the problem. I mean, the sprite zero is definitely not being set properly or it wouldn't, well, uh, okay, now it's gone. Where did it go? <clears throat> It's there, it's just not visible. Why? Well, that's hilarious. So now, now it works, although everything is flickering. And not on purpose or necessarily, it's just Let's do this. Let's set a breakpoint for that location in memory and see what's actually writing to that because it's possible that I've forgotten that there's some other initialized routine or something that's going on. Um, there shouldn't be, but that doesn't mean there isn't. So, I mean, obviously it's going to hit right away. Um, let me... Let me make this a little bit more specific. Let me say I want it to break on if the value... Can you do that? Can you say if the value, a specific value, gets written? Uh, right? No. You can do a range... Well, I mean, this is all kind of where you expect it to be. Um, it's doing the store. That all looks good, and if I press the button for the bullet... registering the input. Hmm. All right, I'm gonna remove that. Is that the old ROM also? doing this weird flicker and it's because it's only partially getting the OAM data populated <sighs> is it because like I said there's too many is, is it there are too many things and it's causing we're taking too long now I mean if we just make it four well why is that so fast what happened did I hit That's a weird. Okay, so that flicker is 
Okay, that that sort of makes sense. So what it, what it is is that we're getting because we moved All right. So what's happening is we moved the code to populate the sprite memory out of NMI, right? Now the benefit of having an NMI is that when we get to this DMA step here, we know that all the sprite memory is populated with the right values. The problem is that then that delays any of the other stuff we're doing in the NMI and potentially makes the NMI run more slowly. So um, if we go to FCE UX for a second here um, and load up our frame counting script, what we should see is that the NMI is pretty whoa. Really? That, that can't be right. That's got to be some sort of bug. Um, am I not populating? <clears throat> the fact that it's so totally solid at that kind of makes me suspicious of it, along with the fact that it's also super high. All right load a stored in there did we remove that step we didn't oh you know why because we're doing it because we're doing it after we wait for sprite zero okay that actually makes sense so that's that's fine um let me rebuild it and rerun here okay so that, yeah. So now we're seeing a consistent 600 frames, right? Um, or cycles, I should say, 600 cycles. Um, and the reason for that is because there's no variation to the code anymore. It's not like we're introducing more code based on the number of sprites that are currently loaded at any given time. Um, that is coming from or that work is being done in the game loop now, right? So that's why we're seeing such a consistent um, count here. So what we can do, <clears throat> excuse me, what we can do is we can say, I think this will work. I, I'm not really, not very knowledgeable about how Lua works. So I will, uh, what is it? Is it a dot operator or something? Oh, well, that's handy. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to Google it probably. But uh, Lua recent. Uh, what's the concatenation operator? two dots couldn't do one dot like everybody else all right has to be different <clears throat> okay so now we have nmi with the frame count there and then what i want to do is i want to do another do 7fe1 count frames and what we can do is put a little we're gonna make this a little bit more interesting we're gonna start tracking uh, time for a couple of different things so this is gonna become NMI timing value and and my last count and my now count. Actually, what is, where do I use, do I use timing value for anything? No, so this can go away. Um, so this is now and my last count and and my now count. Right, and then uh, game loop. 
last equals zero. You loop. Oh, I, do, are we, I don't even need to do that technically. That was because I was counting out how many times we were counting, uh, how many times we were looking at the cycles and doing an average over the number of times, but I got rid of that. Um, let's see, so game loop last. Um, so if uh, address is equal to OXO7FF, let me do that one else. Could be totally wrong on this syntax because I don't really, like I said, I don't really know Lua. Oops. Else if uh, game loop last is equal to debugger get cycles count. Let's see if that breaks anything. Yeah, it doesn't like that. Sorry for uh, the uh, Lua. The intro to Lua. Uh, come on. Logical operator, if then else. Oh, you need then. So if address this, then. Else if this. Then then expected what did that wait, what did that say? Uh, expected near equals then equals oh uh, it has to be on a new line. Okay. Do not appreciate meaningful white space. Line 16 equals. Is it double equals? It's double equals. getting game loop last and then if address equals Until you try, right? All right, so that wasn't, that didn't break anything. So let's go back to the assembly and let's go to the game loop now. And we'll just start timing this. So load A, or no, actually, we don't even care. Store A into, oh, yeah, we do. Load A, uh, two, store A. 7FE and then at the end of the game loop we want to do this before we wait for the <clears throat> before we wait for drawing to be done because we don't want to time that we don't really care about how long it's waiting at the end we want to trigger the calculation so 
because it's going to flicker. Oh no, it's okay. Well, okay, cool. Yeah, so, uh, wow. I wonder if that's actually accurate. That seems like... Twenty nine thousand cycles. Twenty nine thousand cycles. So the question is, how many cycles does it take for the NES to redraw the screen completely? Because that will give us um, See if I can. This is the this is the cycle count of. Okay, so this is how the PPU actually renders. But how many CPU cycles is that? Each scan line lasts for 341 PPU cycles, which is about 113 CPU cycles. So, if there are 260 scan lines times 113.667, Close enough. 29,606. So we're yuck. All right. So we're we're taking up most of the f most of the drawing of one frame right now to populate our our entities in memory and process them. And if we start adding things to the screen, we are pretty much we're pretty much exceeding that interesting the other thing that's kind of interesting is you can see that it behaves differently as we move the ship and I wonder if that's because of the PPU handling this in a weird way so all right so wow okay <clears throat> I guess the question is now, what do we do to make this better? Because it shouldn't be this slow, right? Like, we shouldn't be... We're not really even doing anything, right? We, we have one sprite that's handled... That it's drawing at this point. <clears throat> so, the question becomes, where... Where is all of that time going... Um, and we can kind of start to narrow some things down to see if we can figure that out. So where is... So this is our end of the game loop. Cal uh, stop processing. Uh, all right, so... So I'm going to assume that reading the controllers should be like super fast. So if we reload this, uh, what are we writing somewhere else to, I know we were doing some debugging stuff where we were. Okay. Get rid of that. Why is that still taking 25,000 cycles? That is insane. Something else is wrong. Um, is my Lewis script wrong? <clears throat> uh, so if the value is 2, 
and the address is 7FF or 7FE. Oh, yeah. Well, of course. Damn it. All right. That's much better. That makes more sense. So now the question is, how bad is this actually? If we put it back. Okay, that's a lot better. That makes me feel better because before, and, and and so the funny thing is that that value makes sense now, right? Like it was incorrectly calculating the, the cycle count based on the NMI value, which would be essentially one full frames worth of CPU, um, CPU cycles. So, <clears throat> And you can see that as we add entities, that that goes up, right? So let's go back and increase the number of entities. I didn't have to close that. Let's increase the number of entities and see if we go back to 14 entities. <clears throat> you know, and I should probably do this in A, B, C, D, E. I wonder if it was, what? I wonder if it was reading that as something else. I'd done it in decimal originally because I just wanted it to be easier for me to read, but So you can see that it balloons pretty high, well beyond a full screen cycle as we add more entities for it to process. So, but the weird thing is that just adding a bullet seems to do it. And I wonder if it's because the bullet is yeah, yeah it's because the bullet is so the flybys are not doing any collision detection um, but the bullets are why can't I find because of my So the, the flybys aren't doing any sort of collision detection, but the bullets are. So when we process the bullet, I assume that what's going to happen is if I remove uh, the collision detection, it's going to get suddenly super fast and won't have this problem anymore. Only because I mean I kind of knew that it wasn't gonna it wasn't gonna work as is. Um, what the hell am I looking at? This is process entities loop. The bullet L process bullet, which goes to process bullet. So let's comment this out for a second. Reload the game. Look at our yeah. So. It still, it still jumps quite a bit. For the bullets.
Oh, so, okay, so there's gonna, uh, I think I understand, potentially. So, even though we have, <clears throat> even though we have, the way that this is set up now is kind of backwards, maybe, and I need to maybe uh, uh, I, I gotta. I think. I think I understand. Well, I know what's going on, and I think we need to. I think we need to change it. Well, I gotta double check that. So, so basically, right now, what it's doing is it's processing the game loop to populate memory. Right. F Here's our memory for NMI. And then when NMI comes in, it goes in, it grabs what's in here, puts it into the PPU, and it's done. Right? Very straightforward. The problem is that what we're doing is we're saying, populate this, populate this memory, wait for this draw to complete, and don't do anything until it's done. Um, and so while we might make it to the end of populating everything and we and we're waiting here now in this loop as we add more entities that we have to process it's more likely that the nmi will interrupt what we're doing right and if it interrupts what we're doing then when we go to process this Well, draw complete would would have already been set, right? So we come in to wait for draw complete. You load it. You compare it to zero, uh, to one, and then we're checking if it's greater than or equal to one, and then we're initializing it back to zero. So if we got interrupted by the NMI while we were in the mi middle of processing the main game loop to, that was populating the memory, it would partially draw the sprites and set drawing done. And then we get in here and just go back and do it again And the reason we'd see, so the reason we see it ballooning up is because we're getting interrupted by the, yeah, so what's happening is that we have the counter being set here at the beginning of the game loop and being triggered here before we wait. And if NMI happens, because we're saying drawing is done at the end of this, then well, also because we're doing our sprite zero hits, we're not allowing NMI to return, right? So let's take out the sprite zero hit for a second. This might be this might be the biggest reason why we don't want to do this for this game, um, because we're doing it at the bottom of the screen, and I'm wondering if sprite zero hits really is best only for top of the screen and then uh, otherwise you should use something like MMC3 for um, counting your scan lines. Okay. So if we get rid of this, I bet the problem essentially goes away. Like it should just be, yeah. So now it works fine. It's barely using any cycles compared to what it was doing before. Uh, and if we check the bullet collision, it's still gonna go up, but I doubt we're gonna see those huge spikes like we were seeing before. Yeah, I mean it's still it's still not it's still not efficient, right? Like it's not it's 
not great, but we do see that everything is still moving smoothly, even with way more entities on screen. I bet we could probably, I bet we could, well, we'd probably end up having issues with the amount of memory in zero page, but like if we, we could even add more to this, we could say we do uh, 12 hex, right? But that would work probably without too much. Yeah, so we're not even at half a full frame of cycles based on the calculation I was doing before. So we're we're loading up the screen with just a lot of stuff and it's working okay. Um, okay, so let me recap that because that was kind of a lot of stuff and I wanna make sure I understand it all right and I wanna make sure it's clear in this, in the recording. So what we had done to do sprite zero hits was we said in our NMI routine, <clears throat> originally we were doing a few things, right? Let me do this like a sort of normal flow chart thing. We're coming into our NMI and we were saying um, check, check game state, right? And if it was the main game state, we were um, initializing sprite memory. We were saying um, uh, for each sprite uh, loaded into memory at 200 using Y as our index and we were looping. We were setting up DMA copy which was taking the memory from 200, right? And copying that into the PPU. And then we were waiting for sprite zero hit. And then we were changing the scrolling. And then we were done, right? if I can form legible letters, right? So that, that's, that's the whole workflow that was happening in the NMI and in the game loop, and I'm writing this in parallel, but it's not really in parallel, right? Because the NMI interrupts the game code. What we were doing was we were saying, we were doing other stuff, you know, to transition the game state, but let's say we're already playing the game we're saying process um, for each. I promise these are these are English letters. For each entity, we're going to process its behavior, right? Which makes sense. We're we're processing if it's the the player ship. Actually, I, I'm. I'm getting ahead of myself where we're get input right from the controller. Then we are check button presses. Um, then we are accordingly processing for each entity process the entity, right? We're doing that in a loop. And then we're saying, uh, wait for draw done. So we're waiting for the drawing of the frame to complete before we go on to the next frame, right? And we, and then 
our game loop essentially goes on forever or you know until someone shuts off the system all right so that's the whole workflow of what we had done and so what we did was we said okay well this is this is a little silly because this doesn't have to happen here right the initializing of the sprite memory and the loading of the sprite memory that doesn't actually have to happen in the nmi we want as little to happen in the nmi as possible so what we want to do is in here we're going to add a new step which is um, and just say uh, for each load 200 right so we're going to loop here and load in the mem load into memory location 200 or sprite information and is there a way to select and I don't know Where is it? As far as I can tell. Um, all right. So anyway, so now this is just going directly to the DMA copy. So what? So what's happening now in the NMI is it's checking the game state. It's doing the DMA copy of our sprites right into the PPU, which is good um, because that means it's super fast now. And now we we are waiting for sprite zero. And then when sprite zero hit occurs, we change the scroll. Here's the problem. As we add more things to process into this entity process loop, it takes us longer to do this, right? It's more cycles. And what might end up happening is depending on how things are going, we might end up potentially having NMI interrupt this loop here. It's totally possible that that's going to happen. Now, the problem is that normally we were just in, before we were doing the sprite zero hit, we were, we would, we would go into NMI, set up the DMA copy, and we would exit, which meant that the interrupt would go back to processing this. And so, yeah, maybe for a frame, the uh, sprite information was incorrect, but after that it would be it would kind of sink back up it wasn't a big deal because we would wait for the draw to finish we'd go back through everything looks good right but now because we're waiting for sprite zero and nmi that means that we can't we can't finish processing this loop until the sprite zero hit occurs right and that's problematic because we have sprite zero all the way at the bottom of the screen which means that until we get to this part of the screen where we then change the scrolling information, we can't finish populating this memory. And if we can't finish populating this memory, then we're in a race with um, the next NMI because we got to finish populating the memory uh, and get to the point where we're waiting for the NMI to occur and complete before we can populate the next frame. So that's why we saw it slow down so much, because essentially, as we added more work to the load because of the number of entities, whoa, I didn't want to do that, um, we were missing more and more frames because we were waiting for the sprite hit to occur. Um, now, because we're not waiting for sprite zero, yeah, we're, we're taking a long time to process this stuff potentially, um, but we have way more stuff on screen and because we're not dependent on the NMI hitting sprite zero, I'm going to touch the screen like you can see it, sprite zero down here, then we don't have a problem. Uh, like I said, we might run into a situation where, yeah, the sprite gets despawned for a second, but it'll come back in the next frame. Um, which might result in some flicker, but that's not the worst thing in the world, especially given that we're just kind of getting started and you know we really haven't optimized anything yet. So if we go into Nintaco, just because it's got um, the ability to look at the OEM data directly, 
I imagine that we should see some things f kind of, yeah, so, um, we're going to see things kind of flicker in and out of existence? No. So even, even, so we are seeing things getting eliminated because they're, because they're no longer relevant, right? Um, I'm trying to see if I can make it do something where, I mean, it's pretty solid. So it's, it's really coming down to, it's really coming down to the fact that we're trying to use the sprite zero hit to, um, to, to do that status bar at the bottom or the HUD at the bottom. Um, and if I suspect that if we were to move sprite zero up closer to the top, that we wouldn't see this problem nearly as badly as we did before. So let's see. So like I was saying, if, if that's the case, then realistically, that's an argument for doing something like um, switching to M Mapper MMC3. Uh, and the reason is because it allows you to set up an interrupt for, uh, for every scan line. And then we just count the scan lines. And when we get to the scan line that we want, we should be able to just... Uh, change the scrolling at that point and be done with it and it shouldn't be nearly as problematic as what we're running into here so let's see so yeah that scrolling is obviously weird compared to what what we had before but you can see that the sprites are behaving normally and the game is not slowing down as crazily as it was before. Um, so that just kind of further convinces me that sprite zero hit on the bottom of the screen is going to be a problem and we're not going to be able to use it. Um, I mean, I could be wrong, but just based on what we're seeing here, it makes sense that this would, this would have these problems. Um, so... Switching to a new mapper is going to be interesting because I really don't know anything about the mappers other than the one that I'm using. Um, and I know a bunch of the developers on um, Nintendo Age and Nintendo Age Discord have talked about how MMC3 is a great mapper to use, but... Um, like everything else with this, if you don't know what you're doing, it's going to be a problem. And I think we had even tried in the last frame, I was, last frame, <laughs> the last stream, uh, I had changed the mapper to be MMC3 and it broke. Um, so, I guess the question is, is it worth, I guess if we're going to need that, then we should switch to it because... Otherwise, switching in afterwards, after we get the background stuff working, is going to be a real pain. Um, all right, so again, I got to... So let's see, INS 118, both of which use the MMC3 in a non-standard way. The only known difference between these boards is mirroring configuration. Here for these boards differs from a typical MMC3 board in the use of the upper char address line. This board relies on the fact that MMC3's char bank circuit ignores A13 when calculating A10 through 17, responding to name table fetches for 2000 to 2000 FF. F. Same way as fetches for, okay. This means that the one to 2K, the one to 2K bank scheme used for Char bank switching is active even during name table fetches, 
while char, rom, and ram is disabled. However, on these boards, so it's programmers to select which name table is mapped to each slot, much like char banks are mapped to pattern table slots. At the price of mapping 1k char banks, in the, okay, so what's and then 119, like other TX ROM boards, but uses the char bank number in such a way so as to allow char ROM and char RAM to be used simultaneously. Um, I like that they give examples of games that do this, um, or that use it, I should say. Oh, I see. Wait, these are these are alternatives. So it's Inus Mapper four. Okay. All right. So, um, let's go to the Inus format, and we need to look at where the mapper is set. It's mirroring low nibble of mapper number. So it is these four bits. And we want mapper four. So this would be one, two, four. So it should just be that. And as I recall, this broke it, which is expected to some extent because. we are doing something totally different. So name tables. Okay. Pattern tables. So, okay. Uh, OEM data, nothing. That's a stream over. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, so this is reversed from what it was. Is it re at least reversed from what it was on FCE UX? What are you doing? I, I, I rebuilt it. Reload it, please. Um, I should probably, so yeah, so those pattern tables are reversed. That doesn't help things. Um, all right, so the mappers back to MMC3. Um, let's get rid of sprite zero hits because we don't care about that anymore. Or at least not right now we don't. Um, I'm going to leave this code because it was working. And I think we had put a vector. Yeah, so interrupt handler is here. We can even do, we can have a little fun with our um, push A, load A to. Store a seven F D. So I'm just um, we're gonna make sure that the timer counts on um, FCE UX with the Lua, so we can add timing for the interrupt handler and obviously right now it's it's literally doing nothing so we don't care about it it's not um, we don't we don't we're not expecting to see anything more than a few cycles but um, it'll just be good to have that set up and make sure that it's actually doing something IRQ last and then Here, let's 
load this up. So it's it's even locking up. Um, interesting. I wonder what. Yikes! Wow. Okay. So let's let's reset the game and see what's going on here. So it's interesting. The title screen is working just fine. Mirror, mirroring is looking good. PPU viewer, that's that's all good. I I assume that what I'm seeing here is that it's actually I'm actually changing the behavior of the game. That's interesting. So is it did it actually switch from? Well, it seems to be partially working, and then it switches the. Um, <clears throat> looks like it switches the banks here, and I'm wondering if that's some sort of weird, um, some sort of weird behavior because I'm triggering bank switching inadvertently. So if we read up on the mapper here there are all these bank selects so there are these the you have these um, banks that are readable um, but there's a bank select so let's see if I'm hitting any of the bank selects in memory I imagine that based on what we're seeing here I'm definitely doing that so the question is why and we'll find out in a minute So it's not hitting any of any of that, or at least. Let's uh, you can do a range of um, and what is the to nine FFE even? MMC three has four pairs of registers. At 8,000 to 9 FFF, 8,000 to BFFF, C1000 to DFFF, and E1000 to FFFF. Even addresses select the low register. Odd addresses select the high register in each pair. These can be broken into two independent functional units memory mapping and scan line counting. But I don't know why. I don't know why it would be doing that. I don't recall writing anything that would... Strange. Is this... So my code, let's see. Step uh, run line. So my code is where? It's at this 8,000 range. I wonder if that's the problem. I wonder if it's because the way that the code is being assembled and with the way the mapper works. Because my code is in this range, in the 8,000 range. Um, but MMC3 is using the 8,000 range for stuff, for its, its registers, right? So the prog ROM, which is your your actual code that you're running. Well, no, it says it's still at 8,000, or it could be at C1000. I'm 
a little bit confused by the way bank select 8,000 That's the thing with this documentation. While it's perfectly clear if you know what it's talking about, if you don't, it is obtuse, let's say. I mean, no offense to the people who worked on it because it's certainly better than no documentation and it's, um, and it's uh, extremely com complete, but like a lot of uh, reference materials at least i find that if you are um, if you are learning it for the first time it is extraordinarily difficult when it's presented in this way without any example code uh, that i can find at the moment uh, to understand what it's talking about So, hmm. Four pairs. I mean, the thing is, these are the banks, but maybe I am just misunderstanding this somehow. Program bank mode, 8,009FFF swappable to DFFF. Hmm. Because the values in R67 and 8,000 are unspecified at power on, the reset vector must point into E thousand to F F F F and code must be initial and code must initialize these before jumping out of So the question is I guess first of all is it actually even doing that? Right I, I assume it's not because I didn't make it do that. Um So this should have, let's go to the hex editor. My interrupt vectors are gonna be at the end of the hex data for the ROM. Right, these are the addresses. So reset is the second one. Yeah, so reset is the second one. It's 80D1. Um, So if we go to the debugger and look at the code at 80D1, we should see the beginning of the program. 80D1, 80D1, where are you? Further down, 80D1, yeah, okay, well that's cool. So. So that is actually right, because the, the reset code, first instruction it's doing is the SE, SEI. So that is okay. Uh, because the values in R67 and 8000 are unspecified at power on, the reset vector must point into E1000 through FFFF. And code must initialize. So I'm 
thinking that what that means then is that part of the weirdness that we're seeing is related to the way that uh, CA65 is working. So in the configuration for CA6, 60 or CC65, there is this configuration here that talks about how your program is set up when you are building your game. And, <clears throat> excuse me, so there is the zero page which is defined here as starting from 0 to 800. There is the header, which starts at 0 and has that size. There is startup, which we're not actually using for anything, I don't think. Did I? Yeah, so that's not actually used for anything. There's low code, which isn't used for anything. There's once, there's... Uh, there's code, which we are using, and code is defined, oh, I see, okay, so, yeah, so these are all ROM 0, and ROM 0 starts at 8,000, and that's the size. <coughs> and then ROM V is the vector ROM position. Char ROM is ROM 2, which starts from 0 to, I think that's, what is that, 4K? Help me out, hex, hex brain. 8K, sorry. Um, oh, right, because it's in the second position here. Anyway. Um, and then this BSS RAM, which... I mean, technically we're not actually even using right now so I guess I could get rid of that see like this is where researching this a little bit more would be probably be helpful there's the segment for chars oh that's not what I wanted to comment out so like this shouldn't have changed anything because we're not well I say that and then it's totally broken. Um, maybe that was making it work just because of the way that it was offsetting things or filling things in. I don't know. I don't know. Again, this is this is we're getting out of the uh, out of the realm of what I actually understand with the mappers here. So we may have to end it here at least feeling good about oh is it maybe the debugger has has hit a break point here let me um we have to end it here with me going and doing some more research on how these mappers work exactly and finding some more code because without understanding this exactly, we're just gonna kind of be poking around in the dark. Um, like it was saying here that your code has to start at E0 because it doesn't it doesn't know. And, and that kind of makes sense, right? Because if you haven't set up these registers, then if I'm understanding this right, for 8,000, which is potentially one of the switchable program banks, we don't, the code might not be the code we need it to be, right? This is a fixed bank, it's saying, so this doesn't change. So, like, if I did that change, it's probable that the code is still working fine because we just essentially made all of the code run in the fixed bank. So that, well, that'll be interesting to see if that changes anything, like if that makes it work. No. So it actually broke it. Now you can see that what's interesting is that it is now in this E section 
Um, but if we go to our hex editor, ignoring all of the craziness that's going on there, scrolling all the way down, these addresses did change to E, so E0D1 <clears throat> is what the interrupt vector thinks it should be running at restart, but it does not appear to actually be, yeah, so E0D1 E zero D one is just a break instruction. Um, so let's see. That segment is code, and code is ROM zero. I mean, do we actually need these? There's this. I don't think I'm defining start. Oh, I, ha I am using startup here, but I don't think I need that segment. And mind you, I'm just totally sort of guessing at this right now. So it's not loading that anymore. So our se code segment is ROM zero. ROM zero is starting at we're saying it's starting at E00, but oh, you know what? The size can't be 7FFA because that is no longer correct for that bank. It's 8K. So now this becomes 2000. All right, so that recompile or reassembled. But it still looks like it's putting, it was putting it in 80D1, I think. Similar, similar address, but at 80D1, not E0D1. 80D1, yeah, so it's still putting it at 80D1, even though I'm telling it for the code. Oh, I wonder, no, I am telling it type NES. E0. This is okay. This is for a second Charon bank. Uh, is it because of the header definition here? Let's say we change this to one Charon bank because that's really all I'm going for here. Oops, I didn't want to save the game state, but okay. See you later, Nick. Thanks for watching. We're gonna wrap up here in a second anyway. I gotta I gotta like I said, probably research this a little bit more. Uh Charom. Go back to the header. Header trainer program. Sixteen K times X bytes. Well, it's not even sixteen K, really. I mean, if I made that like four. doesn't really change. I'll put that back to two. <clears throat> so code is what does this actually mean? Big run. Run equals.
equals ram2. So run equals ram. Oh, that's what it. Okay, so what is this saying? Say you've successfully a super operating system. Doing that, you face a new problem. If the code runs in RAM, the load attribute is mandatory, and if you don't specify the run attribute, the linker assumes that load area and run area are the same. Oh, I see. So it's saying load this into ROM, but run in RAM? Well, I understand that it's not the same area, but should that matter? Because we're, oh, I, okay. So interesting. So this should actually be, I have, I'm not actually using, am I not using that segment? I'm not using that segment, so it doesn't matter. Okay. I thought I was using the data segment, but I'm just putting it all right in in uh, in the main code. So um, I think we we should be able to technically comment comment those out. <clears throat> So the main thing that broke it was changing ROM zero from eight to E. Keep trying to hit build and uh, reset. Come on, debugger. I thought that was the main thing that was bro that broke it. But we also changed the size. <clears throat> Was it? It was like seven F F F, I think. It was it was huge by comparison to what it was initially. Well, let's uh Is, oh, it's 7FFA. Okay. All right, so that brought it back. Um, very weird. Again, I don't really know. I really don't know what I'm doing about uh, with this, so... It's interesting that changing that doesn't actually change the placement of the code like I would have expected it to. And it makes sense that we're seeing those breaks because that's where the vectors are pointing it to because the assembler thinks that the code is starting at the E0 location but it looks like when the Nintendo, or the emulator really, is loading it up, it's not loading it in that correct starting position. And it may be a couple of things. Let's see. Upper nibble of mapper number. Be curious to know also if we're even setting the right mapper number. I mean, the good thing is that the behavior is uh, wrong in both. Um, It's totally blowing out the stack. That's cool. Uh, hmm. File info. 
repo. Oh, you can't. Oh, okay. Well, that's cool. So it's definitely using MMC3. It's saying that the program size is right. So we'll put this back to one. Oh, to one. Because we don't really need two, I don't think. Of CRC, that's the char ROM size. I'm saying no char RAM. Program size is zero. Two prog ROM banks that are 8K. Okay. So, how do we tell it to put our code? in the second bank. So do we... We have to do something like this, where we say... segment codes no you know we can do we can even put some instructions here that aren't break instructions and see what shows up in the debugger at uh, at the location can i seek to a position i can i think right e0 d1 <clears throat> 8 0 d1 wow that's not even close uh hex editor let's go all the way to the end where's my vectors oh uh, well, they should still be... Hmm. You'd think they'd still be there if you knew what you were doing. Um... Did they at least come back? So the interrupt vectors are gone, which is why it's not even loading anything in the game anymore. Uh, wow, okay. Uh, well, part of it would be, I would assume, that because these ROM sizes are way off now. Right, they're two, it's 216K. Memory assignment. size from zero oh hmm. the question then is where is it actually populating those addresses If we go to 80D1, which is where the code was showing up before, there's nothing there. <clears throat> and then there was E0D1. That looks more promising. That looks like there's actually code at E0D1. Uh, E0D1, I mean. Okay, so our code is at E0D1, but now the problem is that the interrupt vectors are no longer vectoring. I 
And if we go to 80D1, I don't see my no ops. Well, <coughs> excuse me. All right, so at 8,000, we are seeing the no ops. And at E thousand, we are seeing my initialized sprite routine. Stop switching locations. So that's okay. So that's they're at least being placed in the right spot. Now, why is my vector segment messed up? Seven F F F. Does that have to change with this mapper? On reset, the vector must point to that range, and the code must initialize these before jumping out. Okay, that's, so that's the only thing it says. Um, NES config. Rom V. Rom V is starting at F F F A and it's six bytes, which is correct. Well maybe not. Maybe it's not because if I take So it would be, well, yeah, it would be at the end of that bank. Do I need to switch the order? Make this ROM 1, make that ROM 0. There are my no ops. There's my code. Did I not rebuild that? So <clears throat> codes is now at ROM one which is E thousand. Okay, so that that's technically right um, in terms of it's it's doing what I expected it to do. Am I seeing my vectors? I'm still not seeing the vectors. Why did that get messed up? seeing my pattern table <clears throat> no I'm not so something something in the way that this is being done is <clears throat> causing all of that to break <clears throat> If I rebuild this and reload it and in taco we should see the pattern table come back or not uh oh wait a minute okay hold on um the way that this was working was that it was filling the the size was being filled with yeah i think i i think i understand are we gonna see the pattern table back no. Wait, I don't think I actually rebuilt that. No? I thought I understood it. Let me get rid of ROMs 
zero. And seven FFA. This is a code zero. Unless Mintaco is messing with me right now. Charom is wrong. This is doing whatever it's doing. I don't have my vectors. Just trying to compare what the values were. Before and after I broke it. <clears throat> so that's all the same or that Because I said there's only one program bank, maybe. Oh, so that brought it back. So it's because I said there was only one program. broken do we still see our char on we don't but what I think I need to do where is the calculator so s let me do this um, 8,000 plus 7 FFA was FFFA, which is where the vector starts. So FFFA minus E thousand is one FFA. So I think what it's doing is it's filling up over the vector potentially. I mean, that's just one of the many problems we're seeing here, but that's obviously going to be an issue if we're if our code doesn't properly load, right? <clears throat> so if we go to the hex editor. Um, oh well, I'm only using. Let me bring uh, codes back. that ROM one and then in here and you know I'm kind of like going through and making a lot of weird changes here but I'll explain this in a second if I get it at least less broken there's no guarantee of that of course so code Z is ROM1, which is starting at E0, the size is 1FFFA. <clears throat> the vector shouldn't be getting clobbered by that. And yet they appear to be. If I go to uh, E zero 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 seek two. Oh, there's no code there. Why? Rom one E zero. I, I did change that. 
So code zero. Let's see. So code is at ROM zero, which is at eight thousand. So we should see no ops. We do zero zero zero. But there's the code is not showing up at E zero zero zero. And I'm gonna assume I'm gonna assume that that's just because maybe there's too much. So if I were to do this and build it, I just want to get this to assemble some code. I don't care if it's actually doing anything. I want to see that we get some valid code in that segment there, but we're still not. Uh, Y006. This RAM is not used. Vectors are at ROM V, chars are at ROM 2. assume that you want to oh and these are actually 4k banks aren't they uh, 16k banks one FFA that's only 8k I'm just shy of 8k but isn't that a fixed Let's see. So the fixed 8K bank. Yeah, okay. Well, that that makes sense. That's the fixed 8K bank. So ROM one, ROM one should be okay. And ROM one is used for codes. Let me re. Let me let me change that because the other one is going to be bigger. Anyway, uh, so this is codes. Huh. So E E zero has nothing. That has my actual code. So why are these no ops not showing up in the right segment? I mean, the problem is right now that because of the way that I've defined this, because of the way that I've defined this, the there are two ROM banks. There's this one here, which is a 16k ROM bank, and then there's this one here, which is a smaller one, which is the 8k ROM bank, which is fixed. The problem with this one is that this one is actually changeable at 8,000 based on the documentation that it's it's a switchable 8k and what I'm seeing is that the code at the 8k bank is loading okay but the code at the ROM 
one bank, which is at E0, is giving us nonsense. I deal with enough nonsense that I don't need my assembly code giving me nonsense too. Um, and what's worse is because that bank isn't working, our interrupt vectors aren't getting set, and that means that we are not actually jumping to our code. So with that being said, what we could do is what we had before, where we say this is 7 FFA, I get rid of this ROM 0 ROM 1, I make this back to just having code, and it's po I mean, it'll, it'll start, but, or maybe, uh, I'm not sure if it'll start. I think I have to change. Yeah, so that starts, and if we go back to the end here, we see our interrupt vectors, but the code is starting at that 8000 bank, which is not correct. At least not as I understand the documentation at this point. We want it to start at E1000, which right now has nothing in it. We can't just change this to E. I mean, we could do this, right? And then, would that work? No, it's still not. So the code is still at 8,000. And we have no interrupt vectors. Why is it writing it to that location? Instead of E. All right. Let me make sure I'm doing this math right and it's not shoving the interrupt vectors out of memory or out of the addressable space. E1000 plus one FFA gives us that. And before it was 8000 plus seven FFA, which is giving us that. So that is fine. We have this here. Header is. Do we do we have to? I mean, it's not. Like, do I have to create some sort of dummy filler? I don't. I thought it would fill um, zero is for code the segment code. Right, we're saying we have two, so let's change this to say we have one. is actually going to do anything. No. <sighs> Debug. Yeah, so it's just garbage in there that it's using for the instructions or showing it as instructions uh, let's take a look at the documentation here I don't want to give up on this and end with it so badly broken um, I 
as you assign RAM, names are arbitrary. You must start with a letter. I mean, is it just because it's not contiguous? Let's assume you've written a program on the trusty old Commodore 64. And you would like to run it. For testing purposes, you should run it in the RAM area. <clears throat> so we'll start to assign segments to memory segment, um, to memory sections in the segment section. So these are the locations. Code load RAM one. Type read only. Read only data goes into RAM one. We're not what we are doing here is telling the linker that all segments go into RAM1 memory in the order specified in the segments section. So the linker will first write the code segment. I mean, it sounds like I actually have to do this. I have to reverse the order and say this is eight. This is goes in eight thousand, and this is sixteen. Uh, 16k and then this is at e000 and it's one ffa segment codes does not exist and we need to do it that way because we need to actually force the offsetting to occur Still not getting that. It's still the old code in the in the wrong segment. What the hell? <sighs> Codes is at eight zeros eight thousand. And that just has the no op. Like if I, I don't understand. to be at 8,000 at 8,000. How did I get this to, I thought I had gotten it to switch. Oh, wait a minute. I also had changed this to be just one bank. That probably matters. Like at this point, I'd just be happy if it had the codes in the right places. It's still. There are two 16 char. two 16K programs. There's codes, which is. Code Z segment ROM one. ROM one is starts at eight thousand. It's four thousand hex, which should be sixteen K, right? Yeah, it's sixteen K. So that's bank one. And then ROM zero. I mean, it, it, it just, it seems like I'm just not understanding something about how the way this is all getting populated and what that actually is laying out. I mean, obviously I don't understand it, but 
it seems like it should be more straightforward than it is. Um, but I'm obviously missing a step here. Like, and I can make it. Like I can change the instruction, uh, the program counter to actually go to the first line of code, right? And then if I run that, technically, it should at least partially work, right? So it jumps to a bad subroutine there. Why that is... Whoa, okay, so the jump subroutine for wait for V blank is, it's saying it should be in an address in E, so that's interesting. So the the assembler at least partially seems to understand that it should be in the E. Is it just like something stupid like this where it actually cares about that? I, I couldn't believe that that would be true, but who knows? I've seen crazier things. Okay, so that code is gone. So it. <laughs> oh, well, so now the code is gone from both locations. <laughs> but that did change it. It did. Why is that not here now? to see if the hex editor shows that the interrupt vectors are set properly now. They're not. Okay. Well, at least I don't feel so bad now. Um, so now that has the one no op, but the other part does not have is that too big? Is that some is that is that the issue? I'm not understanding what those sizes actually represent. So it's not even it's not even break it's just ff so i'm not even getting my <clears throat> let's find, define v blank here again do we see
Still not seeing the vectors. Very strange. I may have to give up for the evening. I don't want to. I, I, I hate hate being in a situation like this where I don't understand why it's doing what it's doing. So, according to the documentation, at MMC3 8000, it's an 8K switchable bank. So that's what a ROM zero is. That's for codes. That's working fine. For A000, we have another one. Let's let's do that. Let's let's set that up. So this is gonna we'll call that code A. Okay, and then code B will be equals ROM one. And I know that that's already used. We'll we'll fix that. So code B will use ROM one, which will be at which location? A thousand. Will also be an 8K switchable program bank. Okay. We need another one at C thousand which is a fixed second to last fixed bank. And then we have the last one, which is E thousand. So this is gonna be code C, just two and code F we'll call it because it's the last one. And it's fixed. All right, so those are our ROM definitions, and I'm going to go back to bring our code back so that we're not totally broken. So here's code A, here's code B with two knots. Here's code C, no op, no op, no op, and then here is Code F, which is our fixed bank. <clears throat> ROM2 def definition twice. Oh, uh, call that ROM C for char ROM. Oops. Okay. Oh, it came back. Okay. So is that what it is? We weren't defining all of the ones we needed to define. So we have 8,000, which is one no-op. We have A1,000, which is two no-ops. We have C1,000, which is three no-ops. And then we have E1,000, which is our last fixed bank that has our code. That is looking right and I assume the interrupt vectors are good too because yeah they are that is pretty amazing so now I don't think we're actually going to see anything for the interrupts whoa okay and the game is running that is so that means the code is fitting into the fixed banks and we've got our Okay, so, huh. And I haven't turned on the IRQ, which is why we're not seeing that one get drawn. Okay, that, that makes a lot more sense now. So, now the question is, how do I turn the IRQ on so we can see that? RQ latch value, this value register specifies the RQ counter reload value when the RQ counter is zero or reload is requested through C0001. 
one too many zeros there. This value will be copied to the arc. Okay, so that's that's fine because it is actually I think zero, which is probably what we want. Anyway, let me close these calculators. Um, let's see, hex editor, no, uh, the hex editor is not what we wanted, okay, I want to seek to that, and, okay, so it's got EA in there, that's okay, I don't actually care about that so much, I want to, let's see, to enable it, writing any re value to this register will enable MMC3 interrupts, so, Technically, I should see it start doing something if I go to the hex editor. Um, is there a way to search to a location? Like jump to a location? No. Um, if I go to E0001, I keep doing that, I keep adding an extra zero. E001. Um, So I wrote a value to that. It goes away. All right, let's go back to the, what is the interrupt handler actually doing? Did I remove that code that was, no, so this is okay. So that's 7FD that I was messing with. I don't need this anymore. Well, I'm excited that I got that working. Um, that's pretty cool. So I guess it's probably not updating 7FD in the interrupt handler and the right and the reason for that is it's probably not firing. Let me do this. Let me put that into the code. <clears throat> right at the beginning here. Um, store X into 7FD, no, uh, what was the address? Uh, E001, I want the address, not the, okay, so. Huh, it's not, it's not doing it, so writing any writing any value to this register will enable MMC3 interrupts. I thought that's what I was doing. This register specifies the arc you can yeah. Um So like I can, that's really funny. So I should be able to, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, well, no, they're fixed. So that, yeah, so those are not changeable. <clears throat> oh. Excuse me. Um, this is how it works. Writing to E1000 will only prevent the MMC3 from generating IRQs. The counter will continue to run. Writing to E1001 will simply allow the MMC3 to generate IRQs. Is the problem that it's not actually writing to that address, let me take a look at the code. Uh, what, what can I look for here? Jump subroutine. And then the right to the address. Where's my SEI for the, let's see, E0D1 should be the, yeah, okay. So 
Job subroutine transfer store X into e. yeah, so it is doing that. It's saying storing any value should trigger it, but I don't. Push A, load A2, store in 7FD, load A1, store in 7FD, pull A, return. Um, is it maybe just, do you have to do something to enable those interrupts? Counter will not work properly unless different pattern tables for backgrounds and sprite data are in use. The standard configuration is to use PPU, zero th f -f tiles, and okay. Writing to C0 does not immediately affect the value within the counter. This value is only used when the counter is reloaded. So, do I need to do both? spot I do have a checking 7fd IRQ last value 2 value 1 Easiest thing to do would be to check, put a breakpoint on those on that location in memory. Um, zero seven FD. And if it's actually writing to it, then we'll get a break immediately. Zero seven F. It doesn't look like it because the other ones are showing one. Well, it is, uh, or something is. Store A7 F, oh, that's 7 F E. Wait, that's 7 F D. Oh, it's, it's running, it didn't hit the break point, it just popped up the debugger, okay. All right, so the interrupt isn't actually happening. Um, I'm sure I just missed something here. Let's see. Is there like you have to write something to turn the IRQ on besides that? Write any value to this register will disable MMC3 interrupts and acknowledge any pending. Oh, you have to acknowledge the pending interrupt as well. Okay. So uh, store A into, let's see, um, E000. And then you have to turn it back on, I guess, after that, because it disables it. I mean, that makes sense. You don't want to have a interrupt, a interrupt occur and then another one happen because you didn't acknowledge it. So that that's not totally out of whack. Um, it's still not working though. I mean, it's just not calling that code. Um, so let's see what else.
creating any value to this register will enable MMC3 interrupts. Oh, is it because you have to... Is this just a case of me not reading properly again? <clears throat> Where is the counter situation? Writing any value to this register reloads MMC3 IRQ counter the next rising edge of the PPU address, presumably a PPU cycle 260 of the current scan line. So we got to store a value there. It's like if we do load X, I don't know, 100. Um, no, that's not what I want to do. I'm getting tired of making dumb mistakes. Uh, 64 and hex. Did it actually trigger it? No. Damn it. Uh, oh, dummy. Remember what I just said about making stupid mistakes? Uh, so that should be C001. to this and then to this no which specifies the RQ counter reload value when the RQ counter is zero a reload is requested through C001. C this value will be copied to the RQ counter. The next rising edge of the PPU. Right. So I'm doing 100 into there. Don't need to do that. Well, do I? Do you have to do that? I don't know. And then it's being enabled there. I don't necessarily care how it works right now. When the IRQ is clocked, counter value is checked. If the value is zero or the reload flag is true, it's reloaded with the RQ latched value at C0000. Otherwise, it decrements. If the IRQ counter is zero and IRQs are enabled, an IRQ is triggered. Hmm. I mean, that seems like it should work. wonder if the issue is that I'm doing this at a point where I think I have interrupts turned off. Me. And, and IRQs, as far as I'm aware, are maskable. So that should mean, that would mean that they can be stopped. as I understand it. Um, let 
this is going to be kind of dumb, but I just want to see if by forcing it to do this every time we go through the game loop, it will actually get it to trigger. Don't do that. Don't do this at home. This is just an experiment. No, it's still not. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up. I'm I'm obviously just not understanding something about the way that this works, but um, the good news is that we are now using uh, the mapper. <laughs> you know, I should confirm that because I. I assume we are because I had the mapper changed and it we went through all those gyrations to make it work and everything is in the right place. Okay, yeah. So we're using mapper MMC three. Um, that in and of itself is now working correctly. Um, now that we got this configuration right. So the issue with the configuration is that you have these. Uh, switchable banks of code uh, and then you have these non these fixed uh, banks of code and we were not defining all of them and so the code layout was wrong which is why with that mapper switched the way it was it was not actually loading the game up so now it's loading the game up but we can't get the interrupts which is the whole reason we switched to this mapper to work um, so I will work on that next time on Thursday we will figure out why now with everything turned on the way it is that um, even though I'm writing to the values in the locations in memory that are supposed to trigger a an interrupt um, it is not the good news is that this is all running reasonably well um, and uh, we saw that with the um, profiling turned on in the Lua code in FCE UX that were, you know, obviously there's room for improvement, but it's not horrendous, right? So we've got these, we've got these two counters now where we're seeing our um, game loop cycle count and our NMI cycle count. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty happy with, uh, with that, and uh, we'll leave it at that. So, um, this was a much longer stream than we've done in a while, but uh, hopefully you learned a lot. If you have any questions, as always, you can find me on Twitter at Clarivus. Um I am on the Nintendo Age Discord. Um, and uh, you can always comment on the recording, which will be posted on YouTube after we're done streaming here. So thanks for watching. Have a good evening, and I'll see you Thursday.